man to man Combat hand to hand, hands locked Ready for the last stand, elbow drops, kicks fade bang If I connect you, levitate, better settle mate Lights out, knocked out by the heavyweight Hi, it's Toby from Heavyweight MMA. Today here with world-renowned trainer and former Thai boxer, Mr. Nugget McNaught. Uh, I've been waiting a long time, man. It's been about three months of downtime waiting for the important Mr. Nugget McNaught to get him online. (laughs) Thanks, Toby. I I, I know I've I've fucking fucked you around heaps with the thing. And you know what got my attention? When you interviewed Lolo. And uh, me and Lolo are pretty close. And then... uh, him shooting me a message saying, hey, Toby did a good interview, blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's good, man. Now, Lolo's a legend, obviously a legend of the game. And uh, he fondly mentioned you, and you actually fondly mentioned him in another interview saying that you'd learned some stuff from him as well, right? Yeah, man, you, you can't... Oi, when people talk about gurus and masters, wh- whether, you, whether you're a big fan of Lolo or not, man, that guy's done... People say, I've done my time in the sport. He, he's done way more than me. And they've got it. They've Someone, got it. So, so I wouldn't say there's not that many people I admire in fight sport and that, you know, like everyone has a past and everyone has different things to say about people. But Lolo, I, I can never say, man, he's created some of the greatest fighters on the planet. Exactly, man. And that that actually is the reason for this channel, man. I'm not making any money or anything. All I'm doing is trying to get some knowledge from people such as yourself, such as Lolo. I believe there's a lot to be learned from the people that have been there and done that and done their time in the sport, man. So you're the perfect type of person to have a talk to. Well, well they say that you learn from your mistakes and I've fucking made a few. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, man. So taking it back, speaking of the past, man, the thing that sticks to my mind the clearest is watching the fights when I'm a young a young man fighting as well. I'm fighting in New South Wales with fucking foot covers and shin pads. Yeah, and you guys yeah, are fighting yeah. full tie rules in Queensland against best of the best ties. And the tie boxing show had you versus or you and the guys versus the best of the best from Thailand, Paul Briggs, Tony Hollywood yeah. Hill. And a couple other guys. This show, I swear, I swear to God, I watched that at least a hundred times, just just in awe to see you guys fight these guys. It was awesome. A lot, a lot of a lot of people, and like now, now a lot of people understand it. But the promoter that actually bought those ties to Australia, Pon from Perth, was obviously involved for the communication of like like language and all that. But it was Mister Chun's guys, all from Kiat Pet, which is a gym in Thailand, but. That gym is owned by Mr. Chun, who's the boss of Channel 7. Channel 7's where all the best fights happen on Sundays. Like if the Thais want to see guys fight, if you fight on Channel 7 and you're Channel 7 champion, you're like undisputed the best, like in Thailand. Like it makes me laugh. People say, oh, you fought this Thai. Yeah, in Bangla Stadium, rah, rah. Man, my first first few encounters of Thais was against the best Thais there were at the time. That's it, man. And it was trial by fire back when you had, it was listed on yeah. something that I read that you'd only had about 16 fights. And these guys are hundred yeah. plus fights you're fighting, right? Yeah. They, I, I remember standing there and them saying, ah, oh, uh, they read my fight record out, whatever it was, 15 fights. And then they say, and which annoy saw Chitlada 245. And I was thinking, fucking hell. <laughs> That's it, but man. It's, it's, it is a mindset when like, Later, I learned like the, the ties were my boogeyman. When you think about it, most pretty much all my losses on my career were against ties. And I look, I look at it now and think, you know, like if if I knew what I knew now, then no one would be. But that's that's part of the fight game, I guess. And it's part of now. It's time for me to pass that knowledge to other young blokes. And and I have in a generation of Daddy Cool and all those guys. Man, well, it was a completely different thing back then right like if you think of when i was growing up you had things like bruce lee and all this and and that asian sort of uh mysticism and that and there was a big mental yeah. thing man if i was to go and fight a chinese guy i'd be thinking fuck this guy's gonna be like bruce lee and then you guys back then were the pioneers so you guys were the first ones really doing it fighting the the founders of this sport right so it's yeah. a different thing now everyone's fighting tires and everything everywhere right but back then it was a new thing yeah, hundred percent. On Instagram, there's a Japanese guy. I think his name is Takashin or something. Man, he puts up some crazy stuff, like stuff before my time, like seventies, eighties, kickboxing in Japan and Thai boxing. Man, just just looking at that, there's so much people forget. Like we used to get on a plane, Lolo, like Lolo would bring us for fights. They'd say, "Will you fight this guy?" Yeah, okay. You get on the plane, 
you don't know who you're fighting. You can't YouTube it or fucking get on Google, put their name in. You just got to get there and fight. So it was a different mentality, I think, back then. Yeah, man. Actually, Lolo was saying that for him to step up his game in order to be a good coach, especially with Ray Sefo, he had to actually try and source as many videos as he could and then try and watch different fighters just to try and pick up a better technique. And you can imagine the difficulty compared to now. Yeah, Lola had an amazing collection of videos. I remember quite a lot. I'd go there, I'd either fight myself or take fighters. And the, the highlight for me back then was Lola would pick us up, take us to the greatest Asian food, whatever, Thai food, Chinese, everywhere like that. And then at the end of the trip, we'd always end up in his lounge room, sitting around watching fights and that. And, you know, the fighters and that just want to drink and get crazy after fights. I enjoyed going back to Lolo's sitting and studying stuff and him saying hey do you know this guy do you know this guy look out for this guy it was so it, it was just a different different time i think yeah man and, and like speaking of lolo you've traveled everywhere man you've been around germany thailand singapore malaysia obviously australia um over those times like who are those legendary sort of guys that you that you place at the top of the queue as far as trainers go look if I, if I was to comment now, I would say definitely, look, no one stands out more than Lolo to me, just, just from what he taught me and just from the passion I saw he had for fighting. You know what I mean? And he's still, like, even today, he's still got, like, he still loves it. You know, he's, he's probably switched to boxing a bit more these days than, than the, the kickboxing and that. But obviously, like, man, I, I know myself, sometimes you just get bored and think, fuck, it's like Groundhog Day doing the same thing. But for me, as long as you're switching different different styles and that, at least you're learning something, bits and pieces here and there. But, man, when I travelled, I, I met so many different guys. But obviously I'm going to say Sir De Karachar because he took out, took care of me so well in Germany and that. But he's also, he, he was my student, but now he's become quite a famous trainer in Germany and, and all through Europe and that. He's got a lot of guys that fight on, one FC now. He's got guys that fight all through Europe. But yeah, so so I would say another thing. Like I, I, I'm happy when I look on Instagram and stuff and see him in the corner and and doing stuff I, and combinations and that that he does. I think I, I remember doing that. I think you like it's just it's nice to see. You know, I think young guys today don't realize how lucky they are to have Instagram and to have Facebook and to have YouTube and that. And I think. They don't realize how hard it was for us. You know, we'd get onto a video and like, you know, Toby, you, you'd play that video that many times that it'd be like blurry on your TV because it's, it's the tape runs out or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, man. Very different times. Now I wanted to take it even further back, man, and go back to like when you even kicked off in any type of martial arts, man, I know you did Sindhu Kai, but what was the first yeah. uh, like thing that made you want to even go and train at all? I did Taekwondo. I remember I remember my granddad was a massive fan of samurais and ninjas and all that stuff. And he'd always be joking around and that. And I think that led me into doing t- chasing up Taekwondo. But I'm not much of a high kicker or anything like that. So when I went there, I'm not that flexible, I think. I never have been. And I I, I think when I went there, it sort of put me off a little bit. And then my mate said, Ah, oh, come, come, let's try this Zendo Kai. And I just fell in love with it because Probably Zendo Kai is a bit bastardized Australian karate, but it, it, it was really like real enough with the punching, kicking, low kicks. They were really massive on the low kicks, which later on I realized they stole from Kokushin karate. So like just different, different things like that. I, I started to learn about martial arts once I started Zendo Kai. And I think I trained with a lot of bouncers and that. So they were, they were very egotistical, very big, you know, strong dudes. And, you know, you either lasted on the floor or you died on the floor. Didn't matter whether you're a kid. Didn't matter whether you're a man, woman, adult, you, you, you trained hard. Yeah, man. And Zendu Kai was like this. It's a background of heaps of our, like, guys that came up in, in sort of your times and were successful fighters. What was it about that Zendu Kai that was, made it so popular and then kind of I effective think because, too? I think, because, I think because some of the schools were very big on sparring. Like, you had to spar. You know what I mean? And the sparring was hard sparring. So, you know, like a lot of play, hey, it's like anything. There's there's good football clubs and there's there's not so good football clubs. There's strong, there's strong tennis like clubs, there's weak tennis clubs. Same as the karate. I think I was lucky enough to come through Malcolm Anderson's 
uh, era of it. And, and like, there was Roy Lursa, there was Dave Fenton, all, all tough old blokes. So uh, I guess uh, I just got, I suppose, fried in the classes and had to had to survive. You know, I, I would have been, when I look back to it, I started when I was 13. I probably got my first beat down at 14. And then, you know, they, 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 they had a funny way of teaching. If you didn't listen, they, they, they taught you to listen. That's it, man. And my recollection is that Zendukai guys actually started uh, like investigating and looking into the Thai boxing, right? And they're one of the one of the reasons yeah, uh, they're Bob, involved. He, easily, Bob, Bob Jones was the first person, other than Pon in Perth. Bob Jones was the first. Like, think Pon's a head start already. He's born a Thai, and then he comes to Australia. But Bob Jones actually, I, I was actually at a summer camp, 1980 19, something. I couldn't tell you the year. Maybe in 86, I went to a summer camp. I would have been 16. And they that Bob Jones came, ooh, and everyone was like, wow. And then he, a, he actually wearing a robe or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wearing all that crazy stuff. <laughs> but that, wait, that's what made them them in the day. So I can't bag. And, and hey, he was fucking light years ahead for business and that. When when, when you, you have to give him credit for, for all that stuff and the security, everything he did. But they they said, ah, oh, we're going to take individuals in you know, groups of six or something downstairs. We're going to start teaching you a style Muay Thai. Man, they got put these shorts on. They find, hey, all of them were tatted up, big, big, muscly, dull dudes. Man, they, I was just caught by it. And then I thought, you know, I, I was a, quite a good leg kicker at the time, just from the karate. So once they said leg kick is like a big thing in Thai Bok, man, I fell in love with it straight away. I, I walked into a sport that I'm already good at. So, and then did you, from that sort of time, did you then kind of draw away from the other side of the Zendu Kai and just, just yeah, focus I, on look, the I, I, if, if, if I'm totally honest, I, I was in a battle in my head because I, I was working my way up. At that, I'm 16. I got my black belt at 16. So at the end of that year, I would have got my black belt. Then I got to probationary third, Dan. But I, I, I was in, in a period of that time from... 86, say, say to, I don't know, 90, I was still playing with the karate back and forth. But then I had to fit Thai boxing in. And then that's where the, I sort of didn't fall out with the instructors, but they were getting dirty at me because I, I would miss karate class to go do Thai boxing with Malcolm Anderson. And then I don't know whether, it, hey, when I look back, whether it's jealousy because I'm getting a run or whether they're, they're just angry old blokes, it sort of separated. And then I had to get to a decision where I had to decide, do I do karate or do I do Muay Thai? Obviously, I pick Muay Thai. Yeah, man. Well, that imagine holds. if I didn't. Yeah, true, man. Imagine you'd be the you'd be the a grandmaster. Be some, I'm I'm if I didn't pick <laughs> if I didn't pick Muay Thai, I would have been. I probably don't know whether I would become a bouncer earlier because I was pretty skinny. But that, like that was the all the guys that I trained with were all bouncers and big steroid heads. They all went that way. So I think I, I swung back that way later in about nineteen ninety eight. But but that those early years I, I stuck to Thai boxing for sure. Yeah, man. And then so you're training Thai boxing in Australia. When was the first sort of taste you had of actually going to Thailand or training with the real Thais? I, I went to Thailand in 1993, and that was my first work. And that's another thing. When I got back, I think Malcolm Anderson and that ran a good stable, and they had good. Hey, they had Jimmy Cass, they had Bob Crawford, they had many good boys fighting from there, but. To come back and I'm watching and I've, I've been in Thailand eight, eight to nine weeks and I come and I have two fights while I'm there. I come back and I think, wow, this really isn't how the Thai, like I've just been in Thailand and these dudes are telling me this is how I've got to do it and this is what I've got to do. And that's when I probably like a small bit of me thought something, something's not, it's not that it's not right, but I can go, I can go further faster if I follow going back to the ties. If I go this way, it's going to take me back to the karate a little bit. You know, like the, not, I wouldn't say watered down, but just a different style of fighting. And Menda, again, just to refresh people's memory, like it, international travel is very different now. Like it, everyone can fly everywhere. It's not even that expensive. Back then it was probably like similar cost, but that $1,000 back then is like, you know, $10,000 now. now I, so. I, every time I got a grand in my hand, that was a trip to Thailand. That's how I thought. And if I'm honest, 
I, I, I'd add it in hooker price. That's a hooker's price. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so at the end of the day, when I started going to Thailand, people say, well, the plane, oh, you know, they complain if there's not a TV on the plane or something broken. Man, I used to sit on the plane, put your head like this, because you'd be looking around to see the big screen at the front of the plane. There wasn't fucking uh, cam- uh, TVs in your seats. There were, you had to look at one screen at the front of the plane. And people used to smoke on the planes. Like, it was crazy. It was yeah, really, true. really, really crazy. Yeah, so the point I'm kind of getting at is, like, yeah, it was different. And then and then to, even just to be there, like, it was a, a very alien environment, right? Like, now, it, globalization, everyone's traveling, everywhere, everyone knows everything about everything. Back then, you're going to, like, this, you know, adventurous Man, place, yeah. right? My, I remember going to Thailand the first time. I remember my mates throwing a party for me, like the whole neighborhood, because I was the first person from the hood to go to go outside <laughs> into the big world. I think they thought I wasn't coming home, some of them. And then yeah. you hear all the story, you know, like, you, hey, whether it's movies or whether it's stories or whatever, you know, you lose a kidney, you do this. Everyone's panicking. You say, don't trust people, don't do this. And I think I learned some of the biggest and best lessons in my life away overseas. Yeah, man, actually just popped into my head, like about coming here. I've been away for 15 years now, bro. I'm in China. And yeah. when I was coming here, yeah. people were like, don't go. Like some People, you're going to get your throat slit or something, which is so far from the yeah, fucking when truth. All, when all the terrorist stuff stuff, man, I've, hey, I've heard it all. Like I say, that people are complaining about COVID now, saying, oh, it's wrecked the world, this and that. Yes, it's changed the world. But I went through bird flu, swine flu, fucking chicken flu, fucking you name it. SARS, I was away for all of that. Nothing got me. I'm all, I'm alive, and I'm not I'm not bagging COVID. Obviously, COVID exists, whatever. But you just got to adapt, and you've got to things will change. Hey, people warn you about these masks. Fucking, I just went and got my gym fucking thing put on the mask. So then it's advertising. I don't care if I have to wear a mask. You know what I mean? And people talk about freedoms and this and that. Like, relax. Just just get if you want to do something. It's like I say. If you love something enough, you'll do anything to do it. So if you if you want to go overseas, you'll wait patiently until they open and, and you'll be back over there. If not, don't sit and complain. And, and same with the people. One of my mates puts up stories all the time, George, and says, hey, stop raving on about fucking overseas. I miss going overseas. You went to Bali once in a year. You know what I mean? Like, re- relax, idiot. So like, like, don't get it all got caught up in the whole COVID thing. Just survive Life's about survival. Yeah, man. And back in back in those days, so you're a you're a young fella. You haven't travelled before, and you're going to fucking Thailand, man. How how was it to be landing in this man, country? I, what, what was the feeling hey, like? I remember looking. I remember looking. Hey, just just to go through. It, you know what the Thais are? Yes, they're friendly when they're selling you shit, and they're friendly when they're getting money from you. But when they're just doing their job, they're fucking quite rude. When you go through customs for the first time in Thailand, and they're fucking stamping your passport. And they're just looking at you. You think, I'm going to jail. You haven't done nothing wrong. <laughs> but in your head, you're thinking, fuck, I'm going to jail here. Yeah, man. So so you arrive there. What's your first stop? Have you already arranged your gym or you have to do that when you're yeah, there? No, no. I, I, I was actually with Bob Crawford. Everyone know, remembers Bob Crawford. Used to fight a lot, big heavyweight. We went from the airport. He said, look, we won't stop in Bangkok. He'd been, he'd been two times before. He said, we won't go, stop in Bangkok. We'll get in the car. And we'll drive straight to Pattaya. Whew. I didn't even know what Pattaya was. I, I definitely knew when I left what it was. So <laughs> yeah, it was pretty. It was a wild, pretty wild place. So man, was that like the first trip there? Was that just like a wild mess of partying and training and stuff, or did you focus on no, the training? No, no. no. To, for, Bob Crawford was a very disciplined man, so we definitely trained every day. But Saturday nights got crazy and then Saturday night led into Sunday and then sometimes I guess maybe Monday people would miss training but I don't drink so I'm all I'm always up ready to go that's it man and, and tell me about like what was that training like for for you to arrive in Thailand what was the differences look I didn't even realize like I, we go to Sichitong everyone went to Sichitong Paul Briggs went to Sichitong uh Jimmy Cass went to Sichitong Bob Crawford went to Sichitong uh, from Perth, Damian Meyer was the first ever Aussie guy to fight in Thailand, I'm pretty sure. He went to Sichitong. It, it was a good gym. And I think we didn't realise how good and how how 
how blessed we were to go to that gym because it ended up being your tong, you know, your tong, the famous old guy. He 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 was pretty much won the lotto, I think, three times or something. And and he he looked after a lot of young blokes. So the camp had a lot of rat bags in it. And they had at the time I was there, Nor Torani was there, uh Chat Chai. There, there was heaps of dudes. So it was the same camp, some up Parker and chain trained out. Yeah, man. So when you're over there that first time, just training, or did you have any fights, or there's no chance at that point? I fought, I fought t- twice, but I got. Tr- uh, this is a good story. This is probably one of my favorite stories in my life. We go, we go to the fights. We we go to the. We stay every everyone back then. You would finish training, and then you would go shower, and then you would go and watch the fights at Best Friend Bar. It was like an outdoor bar and a like a ring in the middle, but not a full size ring, just a funny little ring, and. It, after weeks of watching these fights, this Thai trainer, the, all the Thai trainers, the, the referees are all from Sichuan. So, and all the all the most of the fights matched are from Sichuan. We go, we go there, we watch the fights a few times. I keep saying to Bob, I want to fight. I'll fight here. I'll fight here. And he's saying, Hey, relax, just you know, get settled in first. Then eventually they say, Hey, you want to fight? And I fight. And I don't know nothing about Thailand. I don't know anything about schemes or anything. But now I look back, I think I got fucking stung hard. They say, they say, yeah, you fight tonight, you fight tonight. So okay, okay. So then Bob, me and Bob turn up this night. I got my shorts, put my shorts on, wrap my hands, get in. I look across the ring. Hey, I'm a skinny, and the dude I'm fighting is skinnier than what I am. And I'm thinking, oh yeah. And then obviously I walk out. I throw a punch, bang, he's on the ground. And I think in my, I didn't really even celebrate it because it was that weird. And I'm thinking. And then they, you know, the ties, some laugh, some cheer. At the end of the they say, ah, oh, you're very good. Oh, you're very strong. And in my head, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm strong. <laughs> I'm strong. And Bob's getting excited. And they say, ah, oh, you've done good tonight, Boa. We, we celebrate a little bit. Then we go back to the gym two days later. We go into the gym and they say, ah, oh, you did good. Maybe next week you fight at uh, the stadium. And I, I forget the stadium name, but it was actually... Oh, I can't remember the name, but it was a, a smaller stadium, but you had to ride your bike a bit further to go wherever it was out in the bush. But I go to this, I take the fight, Bob, Bob. It was more Bob saying, hey, he's going, yeah, he'll fight, he'll fight. I say, all right, I'll fight. I turn up, man, I'm fighting like the champion of the stadium. I'm nearly dying. In the first round, all I can remember is knees flying past my face and elbows trying to hit me in the face. It was only that I was taller than him that he couldn't score me. In the second round, the referee stopped the fight, I think, to save my life and to save my <laughs> beauty. I don't know why he just stopped it. But I, I was totally outclassed. It was, a, it was, yeah. But, but it was a lesson I learned. Years later, I thought, fuck, those little cunts did that. I was like, they, they built my confidence up and then I took the stupid fight. Hey, how much money did I get paid for the stadium fight? None. How much would the trainer have got? Probably a little bit of Bart there. You get what I mean? Like, like yeah, yeah. you learn. That's it. Because in Thailand, there's no fighting for free. Even at the even at the temple fairs and that, you get 100 baht or whatever. For sure, the trainer thought, I'm going to make a bit of money out of this idiot. And throw him in. Stupid for long. Why not, man? That's the trial by fire as well for you, man. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so you mentioned that the training when you went back, the training was different. Can you describe like what the training was like there and what was that difference when you went back? Look, you, you know, think that, and that's where I got my system of training. Oh, look, a lot. If I if I be honest, a lot of my my training at the beginning of my career, yes, the the actual techniques and that came from Zendo Kai and and obviously going into BJC Muay Thai, but. I probably owe a lot to Paul Briggs and Nathan Briggs because I spent a lot of time with them. I'd travel to their dad's gym and, like, I watched how they trained. Skip for 20 minutes, shadow box, bag work, pads, back on the bag. You know what I mean? So when I got to Thailand, I realised that that was the way to do it. Run, run 10K, come back, skip 20 minutes, bounce on the tyre, then uh, shadow box, pads, and then on the bag and grapple. You know what I mean? So I, I went down that. I think I fell in love with that Thai system, and I just pushed it from from the day I saw it. I kept doing it. And do you think that do you think that system like 
obviously it's a completely different pace of life and culture and everything. Do you think that system really integrates well back home, like in somewhere like Australia? Can people look, do that? Look, you can't look, Soren did it, Daddy Cool did it, Got did it. All, all those boys from my old gym all train like that. And and some of them, like Got Got and Daddy Cool were very lucky because Got's uh dad had a business where they could work from 10 till three or something, you know, like hours like that. So they could train from eight till 10 and then go to work. You know what I mean? Which, which obviously we all know that's not, that's not, it's, it's an ideal like job, but it's not, there's not that many jobs like that out there. I believe that the problem with today's fighters is that they don't train like that, that they, they, they get used to this 45 minutes and I get, Hey, F45, all that stuff. Yeah, it, hey, it's good. Makes you fit, everything. But fight, fighting fit and your mental fitness in fighting doesn't come from F45 or strength and conditioning training. A lot of people go on about the strength and conditioning. And, like, don't get me wrong, I'm not bagging it. It has its place in your training. But you ne- fighting's about fighting. You can't ever forget the fight side of fight training. Yeah, man, and the, that focus on skill has to be there as well and as the majority of it, right, skill and technique rather than doing yeah. something that's totally unrelated to your sport, really. Hey, it's like this. I see guys drilling and doing all these drills and everyone says, oh, that's Dutch style, that's this style, that's that. Shut your mouth. Just just train. Like, it doesn't matter. It's, it's all about if you're training. You, you might, someone might think that the way you train is not good. That's what fighting's about. Get in the ring and show them. Yes, well, this, this is how I train and it works. Martial arts, if you look back to, like you say earlier, Bruce Lee and all that, it was all about challenging themselves. And, and in that process, they would fight other schools. If you look at, hey, I heard stories of Kung Fu on the roof in, in Hong Kong and all that, you know what I mean? From other martial arts now. So it, it did happen in the day. It's not like they made it up. Um, yeah, man. So obviously you, you've come back to Australia after training so much in Thailand and that, did you feel like you had an edge over there? Like when you go back and people there are just training in a kind of different sort of style, you're learning the Thai style, you're starting to integrate that in your training. Did that give you an edge against the like local competition? Uh, look, I, I wouldn't say it gives an edge. I don't want to, I don't want to be the guy that always bags everyone here, but like, Man, there's not much. I don't really. I, I look around the dressing room. I can watch a trainer wrap people's hands and know they're an imposter. I can watch just the way they carry themselves in when they're walking around. The, people more days are about their look and who they are. They, they forget. Same thing. They forget. It's about the fighting and about about their fighters. You know what I mean? But if if I said anything, I got from going to Asia and also Europe. I was very Thai boxing, Thai boxing, Thai boxing. Then when I went to Thailand stayed and I met Serta Karachar and different guys like that, I learned that, hey, these guys don't fight Thai boxing. They, they fight like kickboxing or whatever, but they adapt and they do things, you know, like, like, like it, it's, it's a way of, hey, it's like anything. Everything evolves. If you look, I'm trying to stay away from MMA in, in the podcast, but if you look at MMA, it's always evolving. Sometimes it's the wrestlers. And then suddenly they must, all the trainers must think, oh, how do we stop the wrestlers? Then it's the jujitsu. Then it's back to striking. And then it just keeps going in a circle. So I believe at the moment, me going overseas, it helped me business-wise because I got to see how a lot of, man, some of the gyms in Europe and that are big gyms. So I got to see all of that. Thailand, man, Thailand never had those big gyms in Phuket and all that now, but they do now and it all works. So I think I learned business-wise, but I also learned, fight wise watching people adapt to different styles and and realizing that just because you like this style doesn't mean it's going to be the style that wins a fight man the other thing which i i don't know if i'm just assuming but you travel around and you're a lot of the time through asia right and how long were you away for seven and a half years seven and a half years which decent sort of time bro i think in it's some ways like- that's a big Boy, if that was jail, that's a big laugh. <laughs> that's it, man. And and you're going back and you're kind of a little bit disheartened with the scene and that, man. I was just wondering, like, do you think partly is just the way that the, the Asian things that you're talking about is is more about, like you you mentioned about collective, not collectives, and people working with each other, which is something that I've really come to notice over here too, man. 
like you, when I thought of China, when I came here, I thought they're really efficient. They're good at this and that, and they're going to be really smart and that. It's not the case. It's just that they throw numbers and they work together in a different way than we do back home. Do you think that sort of Asian collectivist sort of style and working together is the, is the biggest thing that sort of influences your thinking when you go back? Because I see you just talking about the promotions, and I don't want to talk about that much, but is that something that you yeah. can learn as well? Yeah, look, like I've pointed out, everyone talks about the Evo era and all of this stuff. But what they forget is, yes, Evo was a massive show and we had big production, everything. But there were little shows that led into that show. You know what I mean? Like we, we all got together as a group, Paul Demacoli, Mark Pease, Mr. C, uh, the Fogarty Brothers, Joe Hilton. Uh, we all worked together, myself and Josh Sexton, and we, we made platforms that rose you to the next platform. So Edamoga is a dirty day. I had my last fight at Edamoga. It's a dirty little venue. But you go from Edamoga to the Mark Pisa's show. Mark Pisa's show to this show. This show, there, there was structure. And same with the judging and refereeing and everything. People complain about all that, but same thing. We all use the same judges and the same referees, which made it that everything was judged the same. I think there's, there's so many problems in Australia, not just Queensland, but like nationally, not statewide, nationally, that all these guys, I see them in their suits fucking thinking they're the, the hot, hot meal of, oh, yeah, I'm going to fix this. You, They don't fix anything. They just fuck it more, fuck it more, and fuck it more. If, if they were all honest, they would just have a meeting. Everyone say, I don't like you because your mother's got red hair. I don't like you because you're fucking this or you fuck my daughter, whatever, whatever they go on with. If they all battled it out and they're all weak cunts because half of them couldn't throw a punch anyway, but if they all battled it out and squashed it and then start again, do you get what I mean? Yeah, man. Then I like you. Could have something. I liked your other solution better, man, of shooting 50%. I thought that was like maybe an easier <laughs> solution. It's like a that quick fix. A <laughs> it was a joke, but maybe I learned that from the Turks I've met. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, man, uh, let's jump off that one. We've you've done enough time on that topic recently. Yeah. So yeah. jumping back to kind of like what you what would you call a sort of golden era of, of Australian Thai boxing and the Australian guys you'd point out as being the guys like you mentioned Paul Briggs, Nathan Briggs. Obviously, these guys were massive. What other guys Paul back? Briggs, in the era? Hey, Paul Briggs never gets the he never gets the deserve that he does because of the Danny Green fight. Everyone just remembers the Danny Green fight. They never remember the Tomic fights to the two uh, fights there. Again, man, the, he went from being a world-class Thai. Hey, he was the first ever Thai boxer to get a contract in Japan, at all Japan. Man, yeah, really, and you never hear anything of him in history. When these guys do these podcasts and talk, and they're talking about, they're talking about dudes that have been in the sport five years. Go back 30 years. And before Paul Briggs, there was Jim Shannon. And Jimmy Shannon's a good old mate of mine. Man, journey, but he's probably had 300-something fights. Who knows? And he fights in the tent, things all over the place in, in the country. Man, there's so many guys. Jeff Ellis, this is Queensland. Jeff Ellis, another old tough guy. Dave Hughes was a karate karate guy that used to fight kickboxing. Man, there's so many people, and I, I don't want to sound like a dickhead, but I don't drink, I don't fucking take pills, I don't do I remember all of them. And, and I might forget it for a bit, and then when someone brings up the name or I see the face, bang. And fuck, I remember that guy. There's, so, there's been so many good fighters from Queensland, just like Melbourne. People don't talk about Darren Hedgecock anymore. Darren Hedgecock had a leg kick like a horse. Yeah, people don't even remember guys like that. To be honest, that's a name I'm just writing down because I, I it's been a while since I've heard that name pop up, man. Yeah, yeah, big one. Yeah, yeah. Darren Hedgecock was an unbelievable fighter. And hey, and you talk back to trainers, now you got me going. Hey, Dana Goodson. Yeah, yeah. Man, I, I actually had a moment with Dana Goodson's son. Like, uh, like I never met the guy in my life, ever in my life. And we go, I go to print the Prince's show where he had the Super 8 uh, for the money. I don't know what it was, but I went with Paul Demacoli and we had an Islander boy fight on there, Matea, the big giant, 180 kilos. And it was the first or second fight of the night. We were over early and we were, I'm watching the fights with him. But Mr. Demacoli introduced me to Aaron Goodson. And I'd say, hey, how you going? And we start talking and then, he's, then next thing you know, man, I, 
what do I say to the guy? His dad passed away. So, man, your dad was a legend. Like, like I, I, I le- hey, I met him on trips away and that. I learned from him just listening to his stories. I think a lot of people forget that now too. Like podcasts are great and I think it's good because it, it, can, it, it actually becomes like it used to be in the fight game. I tell a story and then someone sits in America and they can relate to it or in another country. But in our own states, we don't even we don't even exchange and talk. People think, oh yeah, I'm better than him or I'm this. It's all bullshit. If you're really that good, you don't give a fuck about anyone else. You just do your thing. That's it, man. And then then your next star, uh, your next sort of generation of guys that were coming through you as a as a coach, man. Like, can you talk about these guys at all and how that was? Because like that's back on your yeah. ego shows, etc. You had Siren, Humpty, all these sort of guys. Yeah. Well, look, and here's another one. Brendan Humpty Short never gets the 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 I don't know what the word is, Toby. What would you use? Recognition. Like, like recognition. Was, yeah, recognition. He was such a good fighter. Man, I took the he was one of those guys. You could match him against someone, whether it be a tie or whatever, and he would always excel and go high. Like he would meet the level of the fight and then go past it. He he fought Marwan Parkview Jim uh, from Sam Oregon in Jatui's gym. Man, that was a mad five round fight. He he lost the fight, but this guy could kick. I think the guy was ranked number four at Lumpini or something at the time, but it was a cracker fight. Brendan Humphrey Short. Craig Hogan. Craig Hogan was a war horse, ex-footy player, like like little guy, but like solid as. Like, man, we took him to many fights where, where people thought, fuck, you shouldn't have him against him. And he, he stood the test of time, that kid. And yep. then, man, there's so so many. Sorry, you can't. Hey, Soren, Daddy Cool, got yep. Kevin NTG. I remember I met you in Hong Kong. Kevin NTG was fighting. Uh, Got was and fighting. Daddy cool was and fighting. Daddy cool. Got yeah. fought the guy at Mancock. I never let him forget that he lost that fight. You lost the fight to Mancock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. That, that's actually the funny thing too. Hong Kong um, has quite a healthy respect for Thai boxing, man. There's like a bit of a history yeah. there, and there's like quite a few schools with decent sort of ties coaching over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I actually I didn't get much. We probably didn't get the time we wanted in Hong Kong. But, but the time there, I enjoyed it for sure. And just I'm actually in a place called Macau, which is an hour ferry ride from Hong Kong. And uh, the funny thing here is that uh, there's a big, strong history with the Thais and the, the gangsters that are here, they like to get Thai yeah, bodyguards. bodyguards. Yeah. yeah. So they, they open up these small gyms in full industrial buildings. You wouldn't know they're there unless someone invites you. Little tiny fucking sweat boxes with ties to coaching and that that are, you know, ex-professional fighters from Thailand. Yeah, ex Penny champions and stuff. Fuck, man, I walked in one day. Fuck, what's his name? I can write it down anyway. Uh, I walked into, fuck, I think I wrote it down somewhere here. Let me see. Okay, oh, fuck, I forgot his name. But anyway, I walked into a gym and I looked at this guy. I mean, that's who it was. It was fucking Adachai. You know, Adachai, I walked in, I looked oh, yeah, at the guy. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, fucking hell, I know this guy. So I went and fucking started searching and found it's fucking Adachai. He's retired from Thai boxing, like fucking 28 or something like that. Gone to to here to be a pad holder in a little shitty room upstairs of a fucking industrial building, probably getting paid like, you know, $1,500 Australian a month or something. Fucking amazing, man, you know? Yeah, but they get, I know for a fact, the ties, because one of the tie trainers I had was, he would work from Australia and then go to Hong Kong, back four. He, he, they actually get tips from their bosses. So, yeah, that's so true. you know, when they go out yeah. for the night, 100%. And got, the guy wins big at the casino, bam, they're getting tips, they're happy. Yeah, the they other make thing more is, money man, from their tips and their wage. Yeah, that would that would be hundred percent true. You're right, and then because these guys just hand out thousand dollar bills everywhere from over this place. And then the other thing too, if their bosses or any of the guys within that that gang get in shit, they're on the phone. They call the boys, like because oh, I'm in charge of, a, of security and we deal with nightclubs, etc. You'll be out that, outside the nightclub. You'll see a pack of fucking uh, tires jump out of a van. We run. I'm going. No, 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 no. Please, 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 please. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, but it's been that was kind of the older days. It's not as much of that now, but they're still around. They're still around for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Nice, bro. To jump over to like, uh, I want some advice from you, man, for the people that are like training and fighting now. Like, what's what's the best way to be choosing someone to train with? I, I heard you talk about lineage before. Is that a good way for people? To, like, look, okay, this guy's sure. been trained by this yeah. guy, trained by this guy. Or what do you think? It's it's lineage is good in that, but but you also have to have a rapport with your trainer. If you 
it's like, hey, but then you look at many boxes and tie boxes around the whole world. I, and I know from myself, from some of my fighters here, in the gym, we train, we get along, but socially, we don't like the same things. So they know they have to come and put up with me as an asshole because I, I'll bring out the best in them. That asshole, me and Ricky De Silva, sorry, De Silva, not De Silva, E Silva. Me and Ricky E Silva, it's the funniest. We have a love hate relationship, but but I on the pads, I take him into the deep end, fucking keep him there and, and pull out the best of him. And I think, say, look at Rocky. Rocky came, Rocky, Rocky's been to many gyms, trained at many places around the world, Thailand, like had his own gym at one stage. But he knows when he comes here, I bring out that, like, I don't let him stop, you know? Like, so I think when people are looking for a gym, they've just got to go and try gyms. I think that old attitude, look, I hate gym sluts. I hate fighters that go from gym to gym to gym, whatever gym's hot at the time they want to train there. But that's an old day thing. Now people, they, it's, people run their gyms like businesses. If you can cut a deal and you get what you want out of it, you got to try. I think, I think it's a little, the rules of Thai boxing and the rules of engagement in Thai boxing and fight sport in general has changed heaps. Like with Instagram and stuff like that, I know I keep going back to Instagram, but it sort of rules the world in a way. You, you got promoters that message the fighter direct. In my day, if you did that, the fucking trainer would punch the fuck out of that promoter or slap them or teach them a lesson in front of people. Now it's like just, oh, okay, that's a, it's acceptable. So those dudes go that way because it's an easier target for them. But what fighters need to realise is that if you let your manager or trainer or whoever looks after you, if you let that person do their job, that the, the promoter or the person asking you for the opportunity, they can't take advantage of you. That's, that's what a manager's for. Me and Mr. D fight constantly. I tease him all the time, matching my boys with two big people, whatever, like all the time. But he has the best interest of the boy at heart. It's his job to, to match that boy, get the money they deserve. And also, like Steve Wajanko, I've got a good team here. Steve in the boxing, Mr. D in the Thai boxing. We, we all talk and do whatever. But these days, I don't even know who they're fighting. They just tell me, train him, he's fighting on this date. And I like that. I don't want to be drawn into this and that. Like then the fights aren't that big anymore. It's not like it used to be. The the old fights, I think people had more pride and they didn't want their gym to lose. Now it's just oh yeah. Very different, man. And the yeah. Another question, man. The um like fighters that you've seen in that become successful, what are some of the general sort of traits that they have that make them successful? Like, you know, Look, Lolo talked about watch this. There's only one thing, and Floyd Mayweather says it, and Rocky says it in every day when he's running around here. Yep. Hard work, dedication. Yeah. That's it. Hard work, dedication. If you're not working hard every day, you're not going to get what you deserve. If you don't have dedication, you're not going to get what you deserve. Yeah, man, that's kind of leads on to what Lolo was saying, was like he had so many talented guys come in but they come and go. You get the guy that's persistent, has a certain level yeah. of talent, and they'll go far. Hey, not talking about myself, Toby, but I was a retard. Everyone laughs and says, ah, oh, Nuggets, rude, whatever. But I call myself, so I was a retard myself when I first started. But if you constantly do the same thing all the time, you're going to get good at it. It doesn't matter how good, whatever you think. You, if you constantly do it, you will slowly, you're persistent, We'll, we'll, we'll get you what you want. That's it, man. And the, I wanted to, you mentioned in an interview about uh, you had some, don't get you started on strength and conditioning. So I just wanted to get you started on it quickly. Like what, what was the, you just, <laughs> what, what's your feelings I, I, on that? I just think that too many guys, too many guys focus on this strength and conditioning. I get it. I get you've got to be strong. You've got to be this. I've watched ties that will beat anyone in the world, do the same thing, skip, shadow box, this, that. They don't use strength and conditioning. They don't do any of that. They train like fight-based training. Don't get me wrong. I understand the little bands. Are, hey, I've been getting into it. Oh, I've got a fitness center here. 
I've got to get into a little bit of stuff. You know, I can't look like a big fat bloke trying to get members. How many members am I going to get if I look like a big fat guy that just eats <laughs> hamburgers all day? So I, I do a little bit of training myself. But what I'm trying to get across is too many guys rely on strength and conditioning. And sometimes they forget that it's not just about strength and conditioning. You've got a strength and condition here. You got to look good, mate. That's the problem. You got to look good when you do it. <laughs> I, I suppose that's it, eh? But when, when I was in Germany with Serta, there was a guy, Eddie, and he was he was a strength and conditioning coach, everything. And one day we, he made the silly mistake of sparring, saying, ah, oh, let's spar. Yeah, because they, they do a lot of sparring in Germany. Sad days, get 100 people sparring. It's crazy. So I jump in and I move around with this guy and he's, he looks crazy, like fit, like like abs, like an eight pack. He's phenomenally fit, but he always teasing and telling me every time we eat, don't drink the Coca Cola, don't put the sugar in. Hey, stop putting sugar in this and that. I drop him with a body shot, and I never let him forget it. And I say, hey, this fat old man dropped you. Hey, I'm fat. I drink Coca Cola, and I put sugar in every all my Turkish tea. I pile the sugar in, and I still beat you. And you do all this. I run. 20 kilometers, I do all this fuck. I said, I still dropped you. I might look as good as you, but I still dropped you. That's it, man. Yeah. And the other the other thing with that kind of no bullshit approach that you have, I'm kind of interested in in um what you have, what your thoughts on the psychology of a man. Like, how do you help your guys or what's your approach to getting your guys to be psychologically ready when they go for a fight? Ah, uh, look, I I I don't want to I don't want to be claimed to fame here, but one of the boys, I can't say who it is. But one of the boys I trained who, who had a lot of fights and became quite famous in Queensland, not, not national, he actually has gone on to be a SAS sniper. Awesome. And he, he, he says to many people when he sees it, anything they did to him in the SAS had nothing that he went through at my old gym. So for real? If, <laughs> in for real, I promise you. That's awesome. Because when, when they, they stripped him naked and they tied him up, and they, they are. And he said that happens in Nuggets all they, the time. They I'm used a to bit it. Of stuff and they, like, you know, good. I don't want to go into too much, but they go, they went and they brought a food in and they say, oh, you know, like they're playing good guy, bad guy. And the thing is, you're not supposed to eat the food or something. I don't know what it was, but they're doing that. And in his head, he kept saying, nothing beats me from what Nugget and that did when we were young. So, so <laughs> hey, I, I, I take that on. I take that as pride. You know I, mean, I mean, that's good. I mean, you're building that, like what you'd say, intestinal fortitude through your sick yeah. training that then can apply to other things outside, which everyone knows, man. If you train hard, other things in life are easy, right? Yeah, 1 million percent. That's it. Hey, jumping back to that other point about what it, um, the training, about the, the strength and conditioning. I remember what I was talking about before that I forgot. Um, John Donaher, I don't know if you heard of him. He's a super famous Brazilian jiu-jitsu and grappling coach, super famous. He was talking about uh, the same thing in a way like that, focusing, if you've, if you got X amount of hours in the day, that you, if you have to choose, you're not going to choose fucking strength and conditioning. You're going to choose a skill work. Uh, to make yourself better at that actual sport because it makes more sense, right? Rather than, than yeah. putting that limited time that you have into something that isn't necessarily transferable. Like you're saying, a big muscle guy doesn't know how to fight necessarily. So yeah, yeah. same sort of thinking, different sport. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, bro. Hey, um, and I heard you mention a little bit about MMA. It's kind of it's kind of cool in a way that you're saying that you're now a bit more interested in um in MMA, you watch a bit of it. You've got it. You've trained a few guys here and there. You train with Adrian Pang, who I reckon is a legend. Yeah. Uh, Noguera brothers, yeah. you've got the tougher boys with that beautiful head kick recently. Adrian Pang's definitely, Adrian Pang's definitely a, a warrior. You actually talk about him, man. How did, how did your training with him go? Look, I, I, I met Adrian through obviously living in Brisbane our whole lives and whatnot. And when, when I was doing Zendo Kai at a young age, Adrian was doing Malcolm Su Kung Fu. With some guys, and he had so, fucking so a long was, hair. He told me he had a long yeah, 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 hair. Yeah, yeah, he did have long hair. <laughs> he, he, uh, he, he, he was. He's one of those guys that that will not give up. That's that's Adrian Pang was born with that. Like he, he's definitely a very special guy when it comes to his intestinal fortitude, as you say. Like he, he won't give up, and I think that's that benefits him in a lot of fights. But he's also. He's also he hits quite heavy. I don't think people realize he swings his fists. And like with the Kung Fu and that, they do a lot of the, I don't know the names of it, 
the back thing and this and that. Yeah. Like, man, when he gets you on the ground, he's hurting you with everything. Was it you were calling him a koala or he was calling you a koala? I can't remember. You mentioned something in an interview before ages he, ago. He calls me a koala. He calls me a koala. But when we, we do the pads and whenever, because I, I, he taught me a little bit of it, like to, so that I knew what to do when I got him in positions, like when we fall onto the ground with the pads and whatnot. And I remember grabbing on because I, I, I couldn't hold on long enough. And I'd hold on, but man, it's never long enough. Try holding on. Man, no, that's where I have a bit of respect for those UFC guys. Like, Man, fighting five minute rounds, that, that's hard work right there. And throwing in that that ground fighting too, right? Because it's a completely different energy system. It probably relates more to your your stand-up grapple in tie, right? But it's yeah. different energy system to punching, eh? Different. I, I'm still learning about the ground stuff and different things here and there. So I, like I suppose it gives me another lease on life in fight sport as well. Next yeah, 10 yeah. years. True, man. You mentioned in I your might, oh, you might what? I might, I might end up being in the corner in these UFC fights. Who knows? That'd be sick, man. Um, yeah. You mentioned that you've got a, a, a coach here now, a wrestling coach coming from, is it Iran or somewhere you mentioned? Or? Uh, we, we, we're, right. still, we're still sourcing. It's really hard to get the right guy. Yeah. So we, 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 we're, talk, we're in negotiations with a guy from Iran, and we've also got, well, man, we get that many people emailing the gym and this and that, but we'll, we'll sort out the right wrestling coach and the right jiu-jitsu coach and all that it's your but same thing we're not going to jump in and just grab the first guy we want to we want to test them a little bit and see what they've done has to be the right fit actually one time yeah, i got because, that you you're pretty specific uh, about how you want things to go in your gym right yeah i'm pretty i'm pretty uh anal about, about how <laughs> actually uh, actually uh, Funny thing, funny story back from Hong Kong, man. I'd sent a, I sent a, no, when I was there one day, I was just there. I talked to someone. I can't remember who it was. It was someone from the Gold Coast had guys there fighting. And I was just sitting there. I, oh, how you going? I'm Aussie too. And he goes, oh, you want to help us out in the corner? Come on. So I thought, oh, fuck, I'll help you out in the corner. Then I uh, fucking, Mark Pease was coming over with a couple of the guys. I sent him a yeah, message. Yeah. Oh, you want any help? Let me know. He goes, yeah, yeah, I've only got myself. So come and help me out. So I was just holding rice or fucking whatever. And he, Aaron, Aaron's fighting and that. And then uh, I thought, oh, fuck, now it's coming over. I'll send him a message. Oh, do you want any help in the corner? You're like, you're like fucking, you, don't, you haven't earned, you don't get in my corner unless you earn your fucking stripes or something. <laughs> like, okay, okay. Different style from Nugget, man. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been like that. Yeah, yeah. It's just me. You know, no, it I makes mean? sense anyway, because I'd be exactly the same, but different people, different, different style, man. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and at that stage, I, I, I can run a, in Thai boxing, I can run the corner by myself. I don't need, you know what I mean? Some some dudes need they need someone to pour the water and fucking throw the water, rub down, do everything, and get it done and dusted. And it, the, same thing if you, as a trainer, you've been training this boy for this long, then suddenly you go in the corner, you bring someone I don't know you, you've only written to me on the internet. Suddenly you jump in the corner. Imagine if you've got a big mouth and you won't shut up. What I have to slap you or say, hey, shut up! But it disrupts the whole. Yeah, you can fuck up it. the whole. You can fuck up the whole yeah, yeah. Uh, rhythm, People, right? Like, where's the mouth going? I don't fucking know. That, where's the eyes? Look, fuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so many different things in the corner and everything. Some boys don't even want to hear anything. They just want to get rubbed down. They just want to. They're ready to go. Other guys, they they get put off. They think, "Who's this guy? Why are you yeah, letting yeah. this?" You know what I mean? That they, they think yeah. you're breaking their trust. So yeah, I understand so many, 100%. So many elements. Just, just yeah. pointing out the fact. <laughs> hey, bro. <laughs> jump, jump, jump oi, back. Oi. Okay. Water <laughs> off the duck stuff. Water True. off the duck stuff. Bro, jumping back to the MMA, what are your feelings, man? Being a traditional Thai boxing guy, focused on that, now staying the world's starting to open up more to this uh, MMA. you got your Conor McGregor's, you got all this shit, you got the boys training in your gym. What's your feelings about it? Like, in comparison, like you, you're starting to have a liking for it, obviously, right? Yeah, I like, look, and at the end of the day, let's go back to fighting. In a street fight, worst case, you're going to fall on the ground. So if you don't know how to defend yourself on the ground, how are you going to win the fight? So, like, I'm seeing, like, this is just me evolving as a martial artist. Man, stand up, I can punch on with whoever wants to. Hey, punch me in that, I'll punch back. But when it comes to that, I think to myself, imagine if some young guy gets me on the ground. I, I want to know enough to survive for myself, my own, my own self. Then I see the business-wise, the gym, this whole MMA thing blowing up. Man, I, wa I want my fighters not – I don't want people to say, 
Ah, oh, they're good Thai boxers. Oh, but we can beat them at this. I want to be the king of all sports. I don't want to, I don't want my boys losing to anyone in any sport. And and how do you feel like your style uh, transfers over to the MMA with guys like Justin oh, Tucker smashing my, the head I off the last opponent? The particular style of striking <laughs> yeah. really flows into to a rough, a rough way to go because my boys stand in the pocket and punch on any any boy that comes from this gym and i think after ricky silver knocking out uh the russian the other week and then rocky knocking out fred mugabe the week later every boy from here punches heavy and if you look in the history of my gym when soren started to become famous he was knocking people out with that right hand Daddy Cool became famous, knocking people out with that right hand. Even got started, got stopped uh, Aaron Lee with punches. And Aaron Lee's a tough dude. I think I have, I have a really, I definitely know how to teach people how to use their body and to punch heavy. That's it, man. So obviously behind you there, beautiful, uh, beautiful looking gym, man. Um, open to the public, everyone's welcome, all that. Everybody, yeah, everybody's welcome. Like, like, we're open all the time. We've got good classes. We've got a lot of good trainers. We've got, like, it's a very community feel. Like, we're built. It's a lot different to my old gym. My old gym, there was a metal gate at the front. We used to shut it once everyone was there. Eight or eight, eight to 12 boys in the gym, no girls, and train hard, and that's it. Here, it's, it's a bit of everything. You've got boxing classes. You've got uh, Muay Thai classes. You can do PTs, every, anything you want. This is heaven for anyone into fight sport. That's awesome. And obviously ranging from beginner to, to expert level, right? Yeah, yeah. But from right from beginner, right through. And we've got a lot of kids. We've got a lot, man, our kids' classes are getting bigger and bigger all the time. That's awesome, man. Keep on, keep the training going forever. That's good. All right, bro. Well, we've, we've done an hour, so I think that's enough time of, of yours to, to take, man. But I appreciate very much for your time or your comments and thoughts, bro. It's excellent. Thanks. Now, nah, Toby, I, I look forward to talking to you again. And any of the boys you want to talk on here, you just let me know and I'll organize it. Perfect, man. Thanks for your help, eh? Cheers.